Welcome to Sax Spy, where I uncover the best vintage and modern saxophone gear, Vinti and Minty. Today I'll be comparing three versions of the D'Addario Select Jazz D7M tenor saxophone mouthpiece, including an original ebonite, original marble, and a marble refaced by Stefan Kemmerer. If you enjoy this kind of video review, make sure to leave a like down below. Now let's take a closer look at these mouthpieces to see what the difference is, and then we'll do some playtesting. I wanted to talk about the history of this mouthpiece, its development, and answer some of your questions. I was fortunate enough to talk with the saxophonist and D'Addario artist Jeff Coffin, who I met about 12 years ago through a jam camp at the Caleb Chapman Soundhouse, as well as product development team member Kevin Guerin, and I wanted to thank them for their input on this project and for giving me all these different insights. This whole journey started with Jeff, who at the time was an alpha tester of the Select Jazz Alto mouthpiece. He reached out to Kevin Guerin with the idea of creating a tenor mouthpiece and said he had this uh, great Freddie Gregory that he needed to try. This specific mouthpiece, a custom-made Super Deluxe, was Jeff's main piece for a long time. He played it on Gru Grux King, Away From The World, Bloom, Duet, Live, Mutopia, and Into The Air. Jeff brought this mouthpiece to Freddie Gregory to open it up, and when he did it, Freddie didn't even measure the mouthpiece. Jeff told me that he was the master refacer. Freddie ended up doing some other pieces for Jeff, but none were as great as this one. Now for some context, Kevin had been playing on a very special early Babbitt auto link that had been given to him by the legendary session musician Gene Cipriano, and he wasn't convinced yet, so Jeff mailed him the Freddie Gregory. After trying it out, both Kevin and Jeff told me that Kevin loved the mouthpiece so much that he didn't even want to give it back, and thus started the design of the Select Jazz mouthpiece. The six-month prototyping process began with setting the Freddie Gregory as a baseline to start with, but they didn't intend to copy it exactly. Dodero used a CT, or computerized tomography scanner, which is a non-destructive three-dimensional x-ray machine capable of measuring internal and external surfaces to a hundredth of a millimeter. Some design elements stayed the same, and others changed. For example, the baffle shape stayed the same and was moved ever so slightly closer to the table and the tip rail was made thinner. The first prototypes were 3D printed in ABS plastic and then adjusted since the tip rail and table required higher resolution in order to get it right. The final result ended up in a mouthpiece made from ebonite, which we might call hard rubber, and is milled from bar stock using an uncommon proprietary CNC platform. The outside aesthetic of the tenor mouthpieces was based on the Alto design, which took inspiration from Vinti Autolink Rezo Chambers and Hard Rubber Dukoffs. Throughout the whole design process, Kevin involved other artists like Jeff to help evaluate the design. Kevin himself is a top call LA session musician, and you'd probably recognize him from Gordon Goodwin's Big Fat Band. One of the things that started to get in the way of the design process was Kevin's own adaptability. After a few hours with a mouthpiece prototype, Kevin would be able to play it up and down and adjust for everything. Having fresh ears and multiple people helped to reevaluate the work that had been done. This passing of mouthpiece prototypes back and forth continued for months. One Saturday morning when Kevin was walking his dog in the park, he received a very colorful phone call from Jeff Coffin exclaiming that they had done it. The D7M was the first design that was produced, and from there, they took surveys of musicians and vendors to determine that they would create four sizes in total. These are the D6M, D7M, D8M, and D9M. Here are the reed sizes that were used in the testing and development of each of these different mouthpiece facings, which I like to call the optimized reed combos. The reason that they ended up with the Hemke reed on the D9M mouthpieces is that the big tip opening led to pitch flexibility, and the Hemke reed helped to tame that pitch. I'd learned about these after doing my playtest videos, so I will return and make some more videos on my Instagram with these setups, so be sure to follow me at Saxby. After they finished designing the tip openings, they modified the H ligatures to fit the outer diameter, which is slightly smaller, but these mouthpieces still fit most standard hard rubber tenor ligatures. I personally use a Selmer 2 screw. Jeff Coffin has been using the D7M with the Select Jazz 3S on everything, including his projects with Dave Matthews Band, Flight, The Moment of Now, Santa Digs Me, Side Up, Slay What, Shout It Out, Longest Night, Next Time Yellow, The Inside of the Outside, On the Corner, and all of his upcoming stuff. He pairs this with a minty Yamaha Custom Z prototype and the Boston Sack Shop Superlative Silver Ligature. Now to answer some questions about this mouthpiece that I'm sure that all of you have. What is the difference between the black ebonite and marbled ebonite? The main difference between the black ebonite and the marbled ebonite is the material. After studying the long process of the creation of vulcanized hard rubber rods, I found that in the 42nd step, the production of the colored compound is where there was a variance. This is where they can add in different colored dyes and everything and mix it up to get all of these modeled or marbled designs. This specific color to my eye looks to be the sand version, though the honey was a second contender. 
When they switch out this different material, they have to use a slightly different machining setup. So they use a CMM machine to line everything up and it takes about a few minutes to do the switch and then they use the same design file to cut it. Is the marble a limited edition or is it here to stay? Originally, the marble began as a limited edition, which is indicated by the LE in the serial number, but due to many requests, they will be bringing it back. Depending on demand, they usually make about 100 mouthpieces a day, and each tip opening batch takes about two weeks. So with four sizes, hopefully that can give you an estimate of the amount of work needed to bring it back once the Los Angeles factory opens up again. What thought went into the baffle design? So as I said before, the Freddie Gregory was the benchmark, so they took that baffle and they raised it slightly in relation to the table. To me, the baffle is what helps make it a loud mouthpiece and also contributes to the pitch characteristics of this mouthpiece. Where does this mouthpiece lie on the dark to bright spectrum? Until I find a way to objectively measure that, I would have to say medium to medium bright in my opinion. This mouthpiece has a really husky core to it, which is the main characteristic that sets it apart for me. I really feel that this is like a Sonny Rollins type mouthpiece. What genre do you recommend this mouthpiece for? Well, rather than a genre, I'd recommend this for lead tenor players. When I brought this mouthpiece into a big band for the first time, the other players there, including non-saxophonists, were commenting on how loud it was and how they could hear me in my solos. When I switched to it from my Florida Auto Link and started practicing with it at home, my family complained about how loud it was. So between those two things, it really convinced me that this is a lead tenor mouthpiece. Why are the shanks small? Personally, I don't find them small where I put on the mouthpiece, but the bore is tapered towards the chamber, so the more that you push this mouthpiece in, the tighter the fit will be. After a year or so, they did open the exit bore slightly, as the lathe had left a little burr that had been removed by hand until that point, but now that is no longer the case. Will they add different versions like large or small chamber or different baffle combinations? I don't know. I know that the factory is closed right now and the work is halted, but Kevin does plan to return later in July. I've been using this mouthpiece and I've had some issues with the intonation in the palm keys. This is probably a horn issue, but I did do a blog article about the different octave placements of this mouthpiece a while back using the C-sharp test. I would recommend checking out SK Mouthpieces' two videos linked below to see his perspective on the pitch, among other things, and to see how that test is done. His videos have the exact mouthpieces shown in this video, as he refaced one of them and did the trial with the other, so those would be great videos to check out. If you have any other questions, leave them down in the comments below and I'll make sure to answer them as best that I can. Now, let's do some playtesting.
overall, I can recommend either the original or refaced mouthpieces, as they have a great sound and they feel really good to play. On various gigs, I've played the original for about four months and the reface for about four months, and I was successful in either one. So you'll be fine if you don't end up getting a reface. <laughs> Would you consider getting your mouthpiece refaced? Like this video, leave a comment down below with your answer, and subscribe so that you catch all of my future videos. Keep an eye out for all things Vinti and Minty.